It was the Verdun of the Second World War. It was the most grueling, the most harrowing, and in many ways the most tragic of all the battles waged on the continent of Europe in that war. It was also the most international, for the soldiers of 15 nations fought here and laid down their lives here. Americans, British, New Zealanders, Canadians, Indians, South Africans, Poles, French, Moroccans, Algerians, Tunisians, Italians, and of course, Germans. The Liri Valley, 80 miles south of Rome, looks peaceful enough today. Yet 25 years ago, it was the scene of terrible valor and senseless might. 20,000 souls died here in just four months of fighting, and another 100,000 were maimed for life, and all for the sake of a monastery, a Benedictine monastery. For 1,400 years, there has been a monastery on the top of that hill ever since the monk Benedict founded his great Catholic order and set in motion one of the most civilizing movements in history. The town of Casino has existed longer than its monastery, for 24 centuries to be exact. Mark Antony had a villa here. But it is for its monastery that Casino is most remembered. Twice the size of Buckingham Palace, and yet set incredibly, improbably, miraculously, on top of a sheer mountain 1,700 feet high. Most times of the year, trees and shrubs help to soften the base of the monastery so that from some viewpoints, it seems to recline on a multicolored cushion rather than to squat on a harsh mountain top. But in winter, when the slopes are bare and the dismal thunderclouds sweep down from the wild Abruzzi mountains, the monastery of Monte Cassino hardens into a monstrous eminence, into a veritable fortress in the sky and it was mostly in winter that the battle for Casino was fought. There are two traditional roads between Naples and Rome. The Appian Way, now known more plainly as Highway 7, which mostly hugs the coast, and this, the Via Casalina, Highway 6, the inland road along which the Roman legions trod on their way to and from conquest. It was the route, too, that the Allied armies chose in 1943 as their path to Rome. And inevitably, it brought them to the Liri Valley, called through the ages the Gateway to Rome, and to Monte Cassino, called through those same ages Guardian of the Gateway to Rome. In choosing this hill as his site for his monastery, Benedict had been struck by its exceptional qualifications, not just as a retreat for worship and meditation, but also as a fastness against attack. In looking for a place to make their stand south of Rome, the Germans too saw its exceptional qualifications for defense. Indeed, it had long been described in their military textbooks as one of the most perfect natural defensive positions in all Europe. For from this summit, every movement in the valley below or in the plains beyond is visible. The hill is a great eye looking down and noticing everyone and everything. But all Italy is a defender's paradise, an attacker's nightmare, with its mountainous backbone and its myriad of little rivers plunging down, fast flowing to the sea. There is always one more river to cross and one more mountain to overcome. And ever since the Allied armies had set foot on the Italian mainland at the beginning of September 1943, after their great North African and Sicilian victories, they had been doing just this, crossing rivers and overcoming mountains. They had entered Naples on October the 1st, 
but it had taken them another 14 weeks to conquer the 50 miles from there to the foot of Monte Cassino, mainly because after Naples the weather broke and the Italian winter began in all its icy, drenching fury. soldiers of the Allied 5th and 8th armies, those 14 weeks were a terrible taste of what lay in store, of how useless machines could become when weather and the country conspired to make them so. Eight experienced divisions had taken six weeks to advance just seven miles, and at a cost of 16,000 casualties. Yet to the Germans, these were merely holding operations. They never intended to stay, but only to hinder and to weaken the Allies. For the past three and a half months, ever since the fall of Naples, Field Marshal Kesselring, the German commander in Italy, had been working on his so-called Gustav Line, a natural mountain and river barrier crossing Italy from west to east at its narrowest point and passing through Monte Cassino. A natural barrier, 87 miles long, made immeasurably more impregnable by the skill of military engineers. Cassino was the pivot of that line. Casino was where the Germans had decided to make their stand before Rome. And so the battle for Casino, in the words of one contemporary commentator, was to be a climactic trial of strength, fought to a finish at a time when Germany did not consider the war yet lost. When forward troops of the American Fifth Army in the middle of January 1944 reached the last height before Monte Cassino and sent patrols up to the Rapido River at the foot of the Monastery Hill, they had no idea, of course, that they were beginning the battle for Casino. They thought they were simply continuing the wearisome advance through mud, mountain and river that had been going on seemingly forever. Yet it was to be another four months before they overcame that particular hill and crossed that particular river. But besides the terrain and the terrible climate, the essential thing to be borne in mind about the Italian campaign is that it was handicapped from the start by a crucial difference of opinion between the United States and Britain. There were those people who thought the campaign should never have been started. There were others who thought it should, be, should ought to have been curtailed at a certain point of time. And there were others who were anxious to take away various of the resources in troops and material and so on. Uh, this led to uncertainty and uh, misunderstanding the times, uh, the withdrawal of resources at critical moments, uh, and uh, indecision. And all these things created a situation which added very greatly uh, to the problems and difficulties of Field Marshal Alexander in conducting the campaign. The Italian campaign was very much Churchill's idea, which he forced on the Americans against their will. They would have preferred to conserve their men and materials for the massive invasion of fortress Europe planned for the summer of 1944. But Churchill wanted to wear the Germans down before that invasion by hitting at them when and where he could and by bottling up their forces here and there so that it would be that bit easier for the troops when the time came for them to cross the channel to deliver the decisive blow. When the Big Three met for the first time in the war at Tehran in November 1943, Stalin threw his weight on the side of the Americans. He saw a chance to exploit this argument between Churchill and Roosevelt. Besides, he was scared Churchill might order the Allied troops to turn right into the Balkans when they got to the top of Italy, and so hinder his own plans for conquest there. Despite Stalin's mischievous intervention, though, the Americans agreed to continue the Italian campaign, but not to back it with their full strength. And that was the rub, so far as the soldiers at Casino were concerned. Churchill had had to promise Roosevelt and Stalin that the Italian campaign would be pursued more vigorously. Indeed, he had boasted that Rome would shortly fall, for he determined to get away from what he described as this crawling up the leg like a harvest bug. His plan was to leapfrog the casino front. And so it came about that early on the morning of January the 22nd, 1944, 
British and American troops were put ashore at Anzio, 35 miles south of Rome and 60 miles north of Messina. They met no opposition. The Germans were taken by surprise. Up to a few hours before the actual landing, Hitler's counter-espionage chief was still assuring Kesselring that he need fear no landing behind his lines in the near future. Only two German battalions stood in the path of the Anzio forces reaching Rome. But the American general in charge hesitated and preferred to build up his troops and supplies within the bridgehead itself before setting out for the Italian capital. By the time he was ready to go forward, it was too late, for Hitler had seen to it that every possible reinforcement was rushed to the spot. Even the Luftwaffe put in a rare appearance above the Anzio beaches, and with some success. Despite the Royal Navy's help, the Anzio troops were thrown back and very nearly defeated. Instead of getting to Rome within 10 days as planned, they took nearer 140. Churchill was furious. He telegraphed General Alexander, the Allied commander in Italy. I had hoped we were hurling a wild cat onto the shore, but all we got was a stranded whale. Anzio was an operation in a hurry because the necessary landing craft were due back in Britain to prepare for D-Day. Indeed, Churchill had had to persuade the Americans to delay their return and had had to pinch a few more from the Pacific, hence his dismay. When told that 70,000 men and 22,000 vehicles had been safely put ashore, he merely remarked, I see we have a great superiority of chauffeurs. But as well as Anzio being meant to help Cassino, Cassino had at the same time to aid Anzio. Although the forward troops had only reached Cassino a few days before, they were rushed into battle to give Kesselring no opportunity to withdraw any forces to attack the bridgehead. It was a mistake, the first of many mistakes at Cassino. Although the British and French made some small, though important, breaches in the Gustave line, this, the so-called first battle for Casino, is chiefly remembered for the extremely bloody nose the Americans received in trying to cross the Rapido River below Monastery Hill. In an action lasting just two days, the U.S. 36th Texas Division lost 1,700 men and as a fighting force virtually ceased to exist. Indeed, an American news correspondent described it at the time as the biggest disaster to American arms since Pearl Harbor. After the war, the Divisional Association demanded and got a congressional inquiry into the battle. Although that inquiry vindicated the Army commander, General Mark Clark, Criticisms were raised of the rigidity of the American system of command, whereby everything was worked out in detail for the battle back at base. Their infantry material, uh, as far as courage was concerned, was, was first rate. It was very good indeed. Uh, we felt that they weren't well served from, uh, by their higher command. Uh, they had attended, the, the general trend would be for a divisional commander to to visit his brigade or regimental headquarters, but not his battalions, uh, and for the regimental or brigade commander to visit his battalions, but not the companies. Whereas our practice had traditionally been, and I imagine that was the practice of the British Army generally, that the command always went one uh, unit or formation below the one next below it, as it were. And this meant for a, for a greater coherence and a sense of coherence between the people at the bottom and the people at the top. And again, they tended, we thought, to, uh, to drive them in too hard. The 34 and 36 division of two, uh, two uh, US Corps were two splendid divisions, but they were really fought to a standstill on uh, above Casino and at the Rapido Crossing. And they, 
uh, would not be relieved when they should have been, when we would have thought they ought to have been pulled out and fresh, not put in. They went, uh, they were asked to go in again and again on the same plan and the same front, but with ever diminishing strength, which was very hard, even on the best of infantry. But in truth, those 1,700 luckless men of the 36th were the first victims of Monte Cassino's unique observation position. As one of the German defenders later put it, to have attempted to cross the Rapido River, dominated as it was by the Monte Cassino Massif, was from the very outset a daringly hazardous enterprise. The field of view of the German artillery observation officers over the battlefield was so uninterrupted that any attempt to put troops across was inevitably doomed to failure. Without pause, while the 36th were still counting their losses, the US 34th Division were thrown into the battle above Monastery Hill, and with greater success. They captured some of the neighboring heights and brought the fighting almost to the doors of the monastery before being blocked on this ridge, Snake's Head Ridge, which was to become familiar, all too familiar from now onwards to the Allied attackers. For it was on these mountains, littered with boulders and gorse thickets and larded with gullies and ravines down which you could suddenly stumble, that the real battle for Casino was to be fought. Digging in was not possible on these rocky slopes. Only the German defenders, who had spent three months or more dynamiting holes in the rock, had cover for their guns and for themselves. The attackers had to rely on the loose stones they could gather in their hands and shape into some shelter. There were few paths, and supplies had to be brought in by mule, sometimes making detours of seven miles to avoid coming under the all-seeing eye of Monastery Hill. The Allied casualties for the three weeks of the first battle totaled over 10,000. The Germans had suffered too. But that first blooding had proved the worth of the Gustav line, and they took advantage of the lull now to improve it still more in the light of their recent experience so that it was even stronger by the time of the second great battle for Casino. With winter firmly set in, it might have been thought better to wait for the spring before putting in fresh attacks. But alas, a chain reaction had been started. From Anzio there came disturbing news for the Allies. Hitler was preparing a full-scale counter-offensive. It was not just that he was in urgent need of a success to restore his waning prestige, but he knew that if he managed to push the Allies back into the sea, this would have repercussions on the coming cross-channel invasion, and might even cause a postponement, which would give him more time to develop his secret weapons. It could not have been more ironical. Anzio had originally been planned to save the casino front from stalemate, now it needed rescuing itself. The second battle for Casino had to be even more rushed than the first to save Anzio from catastrophe. But before it could start, the Allied commanders received an ultimatum from the Indian troops who had just taken over from the weary Americans on Snake's Head Ridge. They demanded that the monastery be razed to the ground. The commander of the 4th Indian Division, uh, Brigadier Dimelin, uh, was adamant that uh, all buildings in the area must be bombed, including the Abbey. Alexander, of course, uh, didn't wish to bomb it, neither did Freiburg. Alexander agreed if Freiburg agreed. Freiburg could hardly resist Dimelin. Dimelin himself, after all, was commanding Indians to whom uh, Christian Abbey was not necessarily uh, uh, such a powerful monument that it uh, was more important than lives. Eisenhower had said not long before he left uh, that front that while we were now fighting in a in the sort of heartland of European culture uh, and everything that could possibly be done to preserve buildings of importance from the cultural point of view must be done. Nonetheless, the ultimate criterion was human life and the life of our soldiers. And it was the Germans who had put us into the position where this terrifying crucifying decision arose, in a sense the responsibility for the bombing of the Abbey, I think, is a German responsibility. It's what the soldiers, the troops who are doing the assault, think that matters most. They thought 
that the, the monastery was uh, uh, a vital feature, and indeed it was. Whether it was occupied by the Germans at that particular time as an observation post, as uh, fire positions, or, or as merely as a shelter, is, is really beside the point. It's what our own people thought at the time, and it was the Field Marshal Alexander's and other commanders' responsibility to give them a feeling that they had the maximum support. Even today in peacetime, Monte Cassino overawes the casual tourist looking up at it from the town below. But in the numbing harshness of winter, and amid the tired frustration of unresolved war, the hypnotic spell of its monstrous, almost theatrical eminence must have been total and alarming. This was the crux of it. To the men fighting at its feet, the very monastery had become a hated foe. We had the opportunity to, to send down someone through our lines in the area of Naples, uh, to, to, uh, in, in the area of, of uh, Gaeta, uh, to Naples, um, who should inform uh, our adversaries that we were, had made a decision not to go into the monastery. And we hoped that by this uh, letting you know you wouldn't bomb it, but we failed. And I understand why we failed, because it was war. No one had any trustee in Germans. Most of the great treasures, the manuscripts, the books, the pictures, the relics the monastery contained, had long since been evacuated to Rome by the Germans, though not always for unselfish motives. When it came to the fight, the battle there, and it was to be foreseen that something could happen, uh, some of the troops uh, tried to help the monks uh, to bring away the treasures, and uh, they succeeded. But uh, there's no doubt about it that some of these treasures should not be brought back to Rome or San Anselmo. They should find their way to Germany and to be brought to someone who was very fond of having antiquité. The monks were warned of the intended bombing by leaflets fired at them inside shells two days beforehand. But their reaction was mere surprise and bewilderment, as one of the four monks to survive the bombing, Dom Agostino, points out. None of us believed it possible that the monastery would be razed by the ground, for none of us could see the necessity for it. The monastery was not a military objective, so neither the monks nor any of the civilians present then left the monastery. In just five hours, 600 tons of bombs fell on the monastery of Monte Cassino. When it was all over the monastery, looked like the end of the war. It was a terrifying scene, worth of the apocalypse. There were 12 of us hiding, and miraculously, not one of us was hurt. I, together with the other monks, took shelter under the cell of St. Benedict after the bombing. Two days later, the old and venerable abbot, the Amare, called us all together and told us that they must leave the monastery. Eventually, we reached the village of the Rocksack where the Germans helped us by taking us on the Rome by car. The tragedy from the Allied point of view was that once it had been decided to bomb the monastery, the responsibility for doing it rested purely with the Air Force, and the Air Force saw it simply as just another operation one of many they carried out every day, and did not think fit to link it with what was happening on the ground, which, after all, was its only justification. The Indians, who had asked for the monastery to be bombed in the first place, were not even told when it was going to occur, and in any case, were not ready for the offensive the bombing was meant to support. When they did eventually attack, they were thrown back with appalling losses, as were General Freiburg's New Zealanders down in the town trying to storm the railway station with tanks.
The day the Second Battle for Pasino ended saw also the final phase of the German counter-offensive at Anzio. That that offensive failed removed the need for immediate further full-scale attacks at Casino. So far, the two battles for Monastery Hill had shown how, even in the most mechanized war then in history, terrain and climate could conspire to render that mechanization useless, and that once again, as in Flanders in 1914, the outcome would be decided by small bands of infantrymen armed with bayonet and rifle, machine gun and grenade. An army that possessed no fewer than 600 tanks, 800 artillery pieces, 500 aeroplanes and 70,000 vehicles of all shapes and sizes had become dependent on the humble pack mule. In the hills around Monte Cassino that winter of 1944, a mule was worth a dozen tanks. But although the danger at Anzio was over for the moment, pressure had to be maintained at Cassino so as to deny Kesselring the opportunity of withdrawing troops from one front to attack at another. The New Zealanders were detailed to carry out the next offensive, but bad weather made them put it off daily for three weeks. When it did begin on March the 15th, the Ides of March in the Roman calendar, it was preceded by an obliteration bombing of the little town of Casino. 500 bombers took part, of which more than half were heavies, and in just four hours they dropped twice the tonnage of bombs that had been dropped on the monastery the month before. many of the Germans inside the town survived. Once again, the Allied troops were slow to follow up the initial paralysis the bombing produced, and the numerous craters throughout the town hindered the movement of tanks. Instead of the walkover they had hoped, the New Zealanders met with stiff opposition and did not succeed in taking town or Monastery Hill though the Gurkhas dotted within 300 yards of the ruins before having to give up. Once again, the casualties were appalling. The New Zealanders lost 1,600 men, and the 4th Indian Division over 3,000. As a combat unit, the Indian Division ceased for a time to exist, nor was the New Zealand Division ever really the same again. The Allied troops at Casino were beginning to respect their opponents. I think one ought not to be sparing one's praise of, of the Germans. They were superbly good defensive soldiers, as in their time they'd been superbly good offensive soldiers. And then the very best of them, the one parachute division, which we'd first met in Crete and found tough enough then, three years before, two years before, uh, was the very flower of the German army. And these chaps had been trained uh, in the way that an ordinary infantryman wasn't trained to fight each man for himself, because he normally, in his theoretical training, had started off alone. They were, uh, in a way, they were the flower of their army, as we uh, perhaps conceitedly considered ourselves the, the flower of ours. These soldiers of the 1st Parachutist Division and all the other divisions, they, they fought in that area really on the most uncomfortable and hardest conditions. Even to this, to, to, to this day now, I cannot understand how they did it. 
And uh, they were really very, very brave fighters. The parachute divisions were Nazi formations under the command of the Luftwaffe. They regarded themselves separate from the rest of the army and hence were not overpopular with the orthodox military men under whose immediate direction they came. Like the SS divisions, they could leapfrog normal army channels and go direct to the party leaders, to Hermann Göring in the case of the parachute divisions. I know that we from time to time used the word, the war in Italy is a gentleman's war comparison to other parts of the world. And I must say, this is true in some, in some way. We had uh, some of our division commanders, especially one whom I used to know very well, General, Lieutenant General Ernst Günther Bader, who was also one of these German generals I will never forget. He was a real gentleman. Uh, he was a nobleman in that that way we, we have very few today. And um, he had his little private contacts with, uh, with you, the British. And uh, he, for some time, he, sometimes he, he, he uh, uh, tried to make a little armistice, to private armistice, to, to get his wounded back and the other side too, and to bury the, the dead. With the position at Anzio stabilized, General Alexander had the luxury of time to plan the next, the fourth, he hoped the final, battle for Casino. The weather was steadily improving, for spring was on the way, and the Allied airplanes could come out in force to hinder the German troop movements and to destroy their supply routes. At last, too, Alexander was going to be able to deliver his attack at the moment of his own choosing, instead of it being dictated by actions elsewhere. Also, the drying ground would make it feasible for him to deploy bigger formations, and so the coming battle could be waged not by battalions and companies as before, but by mass divisions. Only numbers can annihilate, Admiral Nelson had once said, and now Alexander, with the American's blessing, was going to have those numbers was going to have the necessary three-to-one superiority he had been asking for. At Casino, he was to pit 13 divisions against the Germans' four. He also had devised a highly intricate deception plan, namely that the Allies were going to land north of Rome at Gibita Vecchia, and he saw to it that Kesselring got to know of the scheme, so that when the offensive came, the German reserves were still to the north of Rome to meet this possible threat, and were moved south too late. Alexander managed also to keep his own front-line build-up secret and even the date of the attack. Many of the German commanders were away on leave, not expecting the new offensive for another ten days or so. The Americans, the Indians, the British and the New Zealanders had all had a go at trying to take Monastery Hill. This still the most hazardous part of the offensive, Alexander decided to entrust now to the Poles under their general Władysław Anders. This was a chance of strengthening the morale of the Polish nation, then under German occupation, by showing that the second Polish Corps, most of which was made up of men who had undergone terrible hardship in Soviet labor camps, could give a great account of themselves in the fight for freedom. Eighty percent of the men in the Polish Corps had been prisoners in Russia. After Germany's attack on Russia, her former ally, in June 1941, 
Stalin granted an amnesty to all Poles with a view to reconstituting their army to fight alongside the Soviet Union. This agreement was signed for the Poles by Generals Sikorsky and Anders in the summer of 1941. Thereafter, thousands of former Polish soldiers from prison camps all over Russia converged on Anders' headquarters in the middle Volga to enroll in the new Polish Corps. Most of them arrived barefoot and in poor physical condition as a result of the treatment meted out to them by their Russian jailers. Some died within a few days of being released. Many thousands more never showed up and were never heard of again. Stalin had been supposed to equip the new Polish army, but the German advance to the gates of Moscow distracted him. Surprisingly, in the spring of 1942, he let them go, and 100,000 Poles under General Anders crossed the border into Persia to begin life anew. From there, they marched into Iraq to be supplied and trained by the British and to be joined by other Polish formations who had escaped earlier. Their morale was high, indeed almost fanatically high, such that it set them apart somewhat from their more casual comrades in the 8th Army, which they joined in the spring of 1944. Casino, though, was to be their first real test. Uh, conditions were rather uh, very hard to, to fight on. First of all, we had uh, no proper bunkers, although we were all the time under fire, day and night. We had no proper bunkers, thus only made occasion of the piece of rocks and covered with the tents. So sometimes you got a piece of the sh uh, shell <laughs> falling into the bunker itself. Now the food supply was in coming not always regularly, especially when we complain about the water because it was very hot and we needed a lot of water and it came to us not always regularly and if it came in it was always smelling with the petrol because we used petrol cans for water transport. Uh, of course transport of the supply was on the mules, so, so sometimes when these animals got a good bombardment during the night, they just dispersed in a various direction, they, they, they couldn't find them until the next day, or some of them just were killed at all with all the supplies on. Now countryside was beautifully looked downstairs to the Leary Valley, all covered with the red poppies, and there was really a beautiful sight, but around us we had rather a lot of rocks, uh, or trees cut by, by shells, so practically there was no one tree left uh, intact. And uh, behind our positions in the little lower, uh, there were even some previously killed soldiers with a still temporary barrier there, so when they walked, uh, you could see some sticking out legs uh, on the arms, and all this created some sort of bad condition. Plus, that in this uh, hot weather, it was in May, it was sometimes impossible smell because we had some dead bodies in front of us and, and behind us. As for France, the place was littered with corpses which were decomposing slowly. Uh, and uh, that was a little bit off putting. Then, uh, which were not removed either because they were mined or because we thought they were mined. But that was one thing. The other thing, because of Monte Cairo looking into into the entire valley, uh, we had to be covered by a constant smoke screen. So that was a bit unpleasant. Uh, there was a scarcity of water. Everything had to be brought in by some means or other. During the day, the movement was quite impossible. Certainly in advanced positions, you had to, you had to stay still, completely still. Uh, during the night, you could move about. No problem about that. No lights, of course, normal. Um, it became hot later on. So the decomposing corpses stank even stronger. Um, I think, of, uh, and of course, there were the Germans who were shooting from time to time, yes. Late in the evening of May the 11th, 1944, the fourth battle for Casino began with the now traditional fanfare of heavy guns. For 40 minutes, 1,600 guns blasted every known German position along the line. It was a bigger noise than El Alamein. Alexander had 2,000 tanks and some 3,000 aircraft at his disposal for the battle. 
The Poles swept onto the heights above Casino and advanced nearer the monastery than anyone else had so far done. But it was still not far enough, and the cost in casualties was once more appalling. The German defenders, though, had a terrible mauling too. Down in the valley, the British and the New Zealanders and the Canadians were also all held up. But over in the mountains on the other side of the Liri Valley, the Orunchi Mountains, the free French troops under General Juin were having a remarkable success. Juin had always wanted the opportunity of trying to outflank Casino through the mountains, and now Alexander had given him his chance. Most of Juin's force were North African colonial troops, many of them, unlike their allied comrades, with experience of mountain warfare, such as the goons. They were a kind of mercenary soldier, I think you could call them, and they were recruited from Morocco. I think they were from the Berber race, and they were tremendously fierce fighters, very brave and they were brought in to the battle just before Casino in order to take part in the fighting in the mountains, which was very, very difficult, very hard. There were a lot of gun emplacements inside the caves in the mountains, and it was a question of people going in and picking them out by hand, as you might say. And these grooms were just the right people for that job. They were paid four francs a day, plus a commission on the number of ears they brought back from the, that they'd taken from the enemy. But this was discontinued after a time when they were found to be bringing back ears which didn't always belong to the enemy. In fact, we invented a verb, to goon, which meant to, to go further than you were expected and completely off the map. The French Corps, with their experience of mountain warfare and their particular aptitude and equipment for the, the thing, uh, made a, a very brilliant attack in the Arunki Mountains, and they broke through that. And that was the primary factor, in my opinion, in loosening up the whole of the, of the enemy's front. So I would say they made a very large, a major contribution. made another gallant attempt on May the 17th to storm the German strong points at the back of the monastery, but were once again beaten off with heavy losses on both sides. It was becoming clear, though, that the Germans had had enough. On the morning of May the 18th, when the Poles tried again, they found most of the Germans had slipped away in the night, and so, at long last, Monastery Hill was taken. This is the emblem of the 12th Podolian Lancers Regiment. That emblem was put on the ruins of Monte Cassino Monastery at about 9.30 a.m., 18th of May, 1944. Of course, it was uh, made uh, on the spot from uh, available material like uh, Red Cross flag and somebody's blue handkerchief. Because we had, of course, no time to prepare in advance. With the Poles in possession of Monte Cassino, the Gustav line had been irrevocably breached. The bitterness of the final battle showed in the dazed faces of the Germans taken prisoner. At long last, the British armour could pour into the Liri Valley. Another belt of fortifications, six miles behind Casino, had been built by the Germans since Christmas. Called at first the Adolf Hitler Line, 
The day before the 8th Army attacked it, its name was abruptly changed in German documents to the Dora Line. This was symptomatic of the way the Italian campaign was at long last going, for it took the 1st Canadian Division just 24 hours to breach it. This was the signal too for the 5th Army to break out of the Anzio bridgehead. It was Alexander's plan that they should cut across the path of the retreating Germans and if possible trap them. But just when the American general, Mark Clark, seemed to be following this plan and the noose was getting tighter, he obviously found the temptation of capturing Rome before the British too strong for him and he ordered his troops to make hell for leather for the Italian capital instead of completing the trap. The whole concept of the campaign was to cut off the enemy's retreat. And it was not only the 8th Army, but the 5th Army as well, who, uh, whose major efforts on the main front uh, were to some extent damaged by, by this change of plan. It was taking the, the course of least resistance, uh, with perhaps the glamour uh, of the capture of Rome as, as the main uh, reason for it. By the morning of Sunday, June the 4th, American armoured cars had reached the outskirts of Rome. During that day and the previous one, as this Italian film shot secretly shows, German troops had silently withdrawn from the Eternal City. Kesselring had kept to his promise not to make Rome a battlefield. On the following morning, June the 5th, while the 8th Army, bypassing the Italian capital, continued its pursuit of the Germans to the north, General Mark Clark made his triumphal entry into Rome, an entry that clearly meant much to him. Next morning, June the 6th, the Allies landed in Normandy and Italy ceased to be front page news. Even now, Alexander was not to be allowed to exploit his great success. The superiority of numbers that had made the victory possible were quickly taken away from him for the abortive invasion of southern France as promised the Russians and Roosevelt at Tehran. Success at Casino, at such terrible cost in human life and human suffering, was meant in Churchill's and Alexander's scheme of things to lead to Vienna and to the heartland of Nazi Germany. Instead, it merely led to another stalemate north of Rome. Yet for the soldiers who fought there and who died there, Casino will always be a victory of the human spirit and a memorial to the terrible tragedy of war. Oh, no, no.